Hello and welcome to the first ever Network Collective. Network Collective is a live streamed video roundtable discussion where network practitioners sit around a virtual roundtable and discuss the day-to-day -day ins and outs and experiences of doing network engineering. I want to take a moment to say a special hello to those of you who are watching on the live stream today. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to come and do this with us. Uh, if you'd like to participate, uh, we will be watching Twitter under the hashtag Network Collective. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your comments, your questions, and we'll try to work them in if we can. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about our biggest network blunders. We're going to be taking a introspective look back at some of our biggest mistakes and uh, how that's impacted the networks we've worked on uh, with the hope of pulling out and extracting the lessons learned. So hopefully one or two of you could learn them the easy way rather than the hard way. To help us do that today, we have a, a panel of excellent guests. We have three joining us today. And so we're going to just uh, briefly go around the table with introductions, and we're going to start off with Carl Fugate. Thanks, Jordan. I'm excited to be here today. Um, my name is Carl Fugate. I'm a network architect at a large managed services provider, and I blog at sdpackets.net. All right. Thanks, Carl. Uh, next up is my good friend, Jody Lemoyne. Hey, Jordan. Thanks for inviting me onto the show. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, again, my name is Jody Lemoyne. I'm uh, essentially a hired gun network guy. As various IT companies call me, I come in and try and rescue them from the things that get them in over their head because they don't do networking all the time. So I get to try everything from small business to enterprise and a little bit of data center on the side. Um, I do occasional limpet blogging that gets collected at ghostinthenet.info. All right. Thanks, Jody. And last but certainly not least, we have Mike Ziga. Mike. Hey guys, thank you for um, inviting me to this today. I'm really excited about this show. Uh, my name again is Michael Ziga, also known as Zig. I've been in the network, network industry for about 15 years now. Um, I work for a Cisco partner doing both pre-sales and post-sales. All right, thanks Mike. In addition to our uh, three excellent guests, we also have the three co-hosts of the Network Collective. Uh, starting us off is the ever-talented Yvonne Sharp. Uh, hi, I'm Yvonne. Uh, I work for a uh, large uh, health healthcare provider, um, and you can find me on Twitter at Sharp Network um, or on the blog at eSharp.net. Thanks, Yvonne. And uh, known worldwide for his uh, rugged and handsome good looks is uh, Phil Gervasi. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, Phil? Hey, everybody. Uh, excited to be here today. Um, hoping to have a lot of fun talking about our biggest blunders. Um, I am currently a senior network engineer at a um, uh, I'm going to say a mid-sized global pharmaceutical, having a lot of fun. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at network underscore Phil. And my blog is networkphil.com. Thanks, Phil. And uh, I ran out the crew here. My name is Jordan Martin. I'm at BC Jordo on Twitter. I occasionally blog at jordanmartin.net. You know, when I'm not here, uh, my day job is working as a principal consultant for data center technologies at Core BTS. So we're going to get this thing kicked off. I understand, Carl. Now, I will say that there has been no end to the hype of the size and the scope of the outage of the event you were involved in. I cannot wait to hear your story. Why don't you kick us off here, man? Yeah, I, I have to admit up front, this, this wasn't my mistake, but I've made similar ones uh, myself, but uh, I was definitely involved in this. Um, so... You know, my story starts out like, you know, a lot of uh, typical network stories uh, being woken up at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. Um, in this case, my boss uh, called me up and, and told me that our entire uh, mobile wireless data network was down. At the time, I worked for a large telecom here in the U.S., um, you know, doing uh, wireless uh, mobile data. And we had approximately 50 million customers. And so but the first... <laughs> The, the first, you know, the first things, I, I remember my words uh, very clearly. I said, that's not possible. <laughs> um, you know, we had a distributed nationwide network, um, you know, with, with full redundancies uh, in place. And, and I couldn't for the life of me, especially at two o'clock in the morning, imagine what could happen that would take down an entire nationwide network. So after I... Uh, decided uh, by slapping myself a few times that I wasn't dreaming and that I was waking up and this really was the nightmare it was shaping up to be. 
um, I called into our knock to find out, you know, and, to, and try to figure out what was going on. And in the back, so it, our knock was actually co-located with our, our MPLS carrier, we, this telecom, we used our, our services. Um, they just happened to be about 20 feet away from each other. So when I called in, um, it, it's kind of like, you know, you call into a call center, you can always hear what's going on. Well, in this case, you can hear, you know, screams and fire alarms and everything going on in the background uh, because the world truly had ended uh, that day. <laughs> what had happened was during a maintenance on a, a remote trigger black hole router. Um, I, I'm sure everyone has done this from time to time. When you are messing around with access lists or route maps, uh, order of operation on some vendors really matters because things mm -hmm. take effect immediately. In this case, what had happened was through a, an errant change, uh, they had remotely triggered black hole the 10 slash eight network. Now, on an MPLS network, that wouldn't really traditionally be a big problem, except for in our case, that was what was used for all of the loopback numbering. Well, in an MPLS network, loopback reachability is kind mm -hmm. of important. So um, we had over 5,000 routers that lost their uh, IBGP peering uh, back to the rest of the network. Now, my network, uh, I'm just a customer of this, uh, of this carrier, um, happened to use eVPN solutions to interconnect all of these things. It rode over that MPLS network. So my entire network was down, their entire network was down, and all of their customers were also down. Um, now, to, to make matters worse, um, in order for a remote trigger black hole router to work, it has to be peered to the network. So until you can take that router offline, you can't restore anything. Well, and guess what? Generally, people get to these routers by going over the network. Um, so they physically had to dispatch someone to go and pull the power plug on this device in order to, to start to restore services. I'm and just, <laughs> I'm imagining hell here because I, I, know, I know service providers who run these black hole routers as VMs. Mm. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm just, I'm just imagining having to like take down the whole virtual environment. For the yeah, and it, it would never go down, right? It's, uh, it would just shift from VM farm to VM farm. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't even know That's where so it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, this uh, fortunately, this was a decade ago when we were actually, you know, still using, you know, uh, you know, routers, you know, for for what they were intended to use to be used for, but. Um, so, so eventually this gets restored, but you know, as you guys are aw all aware, you know, um, a small, a small outage, you know, where just all of your WAN links go down, um, you know, that's not even the biggest problem. At that point, the biggest problem is actually restoring everything that wasn't communicating for hours. You know, databases yeah. really mm -hmm. don't like that. Um, you know, yep. things, uh, you know, log syncs and things that haven't happened really start to become a problem. So. You know, our lesson, you know, was my, for me, the biggest lesson that I learned is anything is possible, no matter what you think, no matter how redundant or how well designed a network is, uh, there's always something out there that uh, you, you didn't think of uh, that, that's going to come back and, and haunt you at some point. All right. Uh, there's, uh, there's something you said in there that I thought was interesting, and that was um, <laughs> that you were the customer. And, and I guess I, a lot of, I have expectations that if I'm the customer of an ISP, that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be protecting themselves from what I could possibly inflict on their network. It sounds like they weren't doing that in this case. Well, this was, this was actually self-harm. So they, that was, it was their remote trigger black hole router on, on their network. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of expected that, you know, this, you know, we, we were going to run into this. <laughs> right. Sure. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, so what was the what was the scope? Like, I mean, like it was nationwide, right? MPLS network that was down. Was... No, well, so no, so our wireless data network. You know, we were U.S. carriers, so that only impacted our U.S. But the as from an MPLS perspective, that was global. Oh. <laughs> so, um, you know, they're a global carrier, so we impacted you know countries all around the world. Uh, it was it was quite a substantial outage. Um, you know, and it's, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, the, the guy uh, that was given the demo at, at, at a Microsoft conference, you know, and you get the, the blue screen of death. You know, this was an honest mistake. This, this could have happened to anyone. And it's happened to me. I, I, I've made changes to 
uh, you know, prefix lists or, or route maps. And if you don't look at the order of, of what you're doing, uh, all of a sudden uh, a deny starts to take, you know, uh, preference mm -hmm. over, over a permit and uh, you, you lose access to the device that you were on and this becomes a really big outage. Um, you know, it, it's, it's important to, to kind of take your time and, and to understand, you know, really evaluate what's the risk. Um, you know, in, in a major change like that. Mm -hmm. yep. so, well, the hardest uh, thing uh, cool. with, uh, with network engineering architecture, especially, is like understanding what those cascading failures could be mm -hmm. and anticipating those and putting systems in place to stop the cascade. Because uh, I think we've all found ourselves in one of those and you're like, oh, like I've got this one thing that's broken, but now I've got all these other dominoes that have fallen and you suddenly are like, how do we get back? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm going to say from a, a scope perspective, unless we have someone working from NASA, I don't think anyone's going to trump <laughs> that one. Uh, <laughs> I like how he said, well, it only affected the U.S. Yes, our MPLS was global, but yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah it, my, my responsibility was just the U.S. Just, yeah. just a little. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you, Carl. Uh, uh, Jody, uh, I'm not even going to preempt yours at all. I just want to hear what you, uh, what you have to bring to the table because I know you've got some good stories. Well, it certainly doesn't have the scope of that one. That one, like, there's just, no, no, not even going to try. But uh, I am going to tell you, going to gather everyone around and tell you a story a long time ago in an IT environment far, far away. Um, back in the 90s, back when I was very firmly, early 90s, actually, when I was very firmly on the Dunning-Kruger side of imposter syndrome, um, <clears throat> when I knew a lot less than I thought I did, I was given the task of building an expansion office for the company that I worked for. Uh, we had run out of space at our current building, and so we had rented space at a new building, and we were going to expand massively. We had about 800 people across across the board, server farms on both sides, or, well, what server farms were back then anyway. And we figured, okay, let's not go to our ISPs and our, our various uh, telco providers for this because they're going to see the opportunity to charge us an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. Let's look at other options. Oh, well, the, the local power company in Toronto had laid scads of fiber to handle their own systems and it was far more than they ever needed. So they'd started selling it off, at least leasing it off as dark fiber. And we said, okay, we can condition both ends ourselves. It'll be great. No problem. This was easy. And how hard could it be? You're going to put a couple fiber connections in. You're going to connect the environments. It's going to be easy, right? Well, I made the decision. No, I defaulted to the decision of establishing a layer two connection between these two buildings. And this is long before the days of, you know, monitoring. <laughs> you just <laughs> plug things in and let them go. That was just what you did back then, especially if your experience was fairly minimal. Were, were switches still bridges back then? No, they were actually switches. They were the cutting edge Catalyst 5500 with the route switch module as the daughter board sticking on the, sticking on the top. Wasn't that something else? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we, we had that going on. We did not have the route switch module sticking on the daughter board at the top, believe it or not, or this might have been more easily solved. So the problem is this doesn't bring down the network. This just makes the network erratic. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some stuff works, some yep. stuff doesn't. Broadcast saturation gets interesting because you've got a 100 megabit link between two 400 person 100 megabit environments and you're wondering what could possibly go wrong in that. Well, we found out the hard way. So here we are very quickly ordering a layer three switch was, hey, this was the new thing. Um, we put in a 2948G L3. <laughs> Now, for anyone who's ever worked on a 2948GL3, these are the horrors of layer three switches. These were the things that Cisco did their lesson learned from mm -hmm. to, to develop better switching models down the road. It did fix things. It was able to segregate our environments and everything went well. Um, it had its own problems down the road. I'm not going uh, not gonna to defend it, but it fixed the immediate problem. And... I think it was that moment that was the transition from Dunning-Kruger to imposter syndrome, where I realized just how little I actually knew about the situation and how much I needed to know. 
And the lesson learned is if you don't fully understand what you're doing, it's going to bite you. It, yeah. it just is. There's, a, you, know, you might get away with it once or twice, but it's going to call you back. It's a skeleton in the closet that you're going to have to go revisit. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, yeah, if, thankfully in this day and age, you can lab everything before you actually do it. But back then, if you didn't have, con have production equipment to play with or a good budget, neither of which we really had, uh, that was the way it was. I got to say, the only time I actually ever really feel like I, quote, know what I'm doing, like you were saying, is when I'm teaching somebody that has no idea what networking is. And I'm like, a VLAN is a, you know, thing with a layer two broadcast. <laughs> Easy. But yeah. any other time I'm at work, cut over anything, not, no. And well, there's this, I there's this no idea what you get in your gut right before you hit the button or every, shut down the interface every single time. Yes. Or when Will you it go like, bad? A copy run start on your Nexus and it goes mm -hmm. away for a little while and they do it every single time, but you're still like, oh, show me my prompt. Show me my prompt. <laughs> Is it going to come back? Is yeah. it going to come right. back? I mean, do it, a good it's job. just the nature of the beast, I think. Yeah. yeah, and and it's kind of interesting because being the hired gun and the guy who gets brought in as the specialist to various other IT companies that aren't networking organizations, it's really easy for me to to kind of feel bigger than my britches. Mm. So it's kind of nice to have crowds like this to talk to, go to places like Cisco Live, where you get to walk amongst the giants and experience the imposter syndrome and realize thou art mortal, thou art mortal. It's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, how about you, Zig? How about, uh, what, what'd you bring us today? Hey guys. Um, so my network break situation <clears throat> goes back in time, maybe not to the scale of Carl's, but it, um, or as, as far as back as, um, as Jody's, but, uh, it's about 2006 and this, the impact was pretty big. Um, this was back when I was in the military in the Marine Corps and I was stationed out in, uh, in Iraq. Um, and, uh, when we had a network out in Iraq, we had our, what we call our pop or point of presence and mm -hmm. our server farm all in the same um, switch cabinet and rack. Um, and we had single points of failure across the board. Um, and, and, and one day, um, one of my sergeants decided to tell me to uh, shut down a VLAN interface on uh, this, this kind of, we called it like the server switch. And um, I, I questioned it in my head for a minute. Like, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but he was a sergeant and I asked him and he said, yep, go ahead and shut it down. Um, so I went in and shut down VLAN 100 and about 30 seconds later, lost connection to the entire network for about five minutes. Um, and, and the impact of this really was, uh, this was our classified network out in Iraq. So it was kind of a big deal. So you could see me rushing around with the Cat5 uh, uh, a console cable to plug into the back of the, the switch we've, to go shut VLAN 100, right? We've all been there. We've never so, been there before. Oh, no, no, that's no. just you. Yeah, just me, right? Running with a console cable. Exactly. Like, that's mm. never good. But the classified <laughs> network was truly classified for the first time. It was awesome. Yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they do say that security, right? The best security is just to turn everything off. So, yep. I mean, you Air achieved gap, your goal, off, right? Yeah. 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 What, what yeah, was it totally. Franklin said? A secret can be kept between two people as long as one of them is dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, real quick, the lessons learned for me was um, trust yourself. Trust your knowledge. Um, maybe double check what someone's trying to tell you to do. Um, and just don't be blinded by your own knowledge. Yep. For sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to let Yvonne or Phil choose. Who wants to go next? <laughs> Are we going to draw straws? Virtual draw straws. straws virtual no, straws. I'll, I'll, I'll go. All yeah. right. <laughs> I, I won't force Phil to be chivalrous. I'll just take it. <laughs> well, ladies first. I meant software defined straws. Excuse me. <laughs> yes. Of virtual software defined straws. Uh, so my story, really, the, the outage wasn't huge, but I think the lesson learned is pretty important. So um, in our environment, we had um, three proxy servers that, um, that we didn't have the feature that uh, kept the configurations in sync. So we configured each of them independently, mm -hmm. and then we front-ended them with a load balancer. Um, and if you're familiar with how uh, proxy and auto detect settings work, there's a WPAD file that your uh, browser will reach out to via DNS and it'll pull that file down and it will tell your client how to interact with the proxy server, what to send and what to send direct and all that. I was um, 
going to download it and look at the WPAD file because I needed to make a revision to it. Um, what I didn't realize is that right beside the download button was also a delete button. And oh, that sounds like a good UI. <laughs> it, it, don't begin with D. I, I, I really <laughs> wondered before we started this, how many of the issues that we've had would be like user interface problems, right? <laughs> like just bad user interface design. Um, and so I hit the delete button. It didn't have any idea. And then we started getting a few tickets here and there like, hey, I can't get to the internet. And of course you're like, yeah, it's a browser error. It's a client problem. But then we get enough of them that we can't ignore them. So, so what was happening, the load balancer wasn't failing over because it was still getting responses from the service on that port, but the file just wasn't there. So uh, we, uh, one of my colleagues was on call and so he was getting all the tickets. And he found the problem. And when he found it, he knew I'd been in the, the proxy or the, yeah, the proxy earlier that day. And he walked up to me and he almost whispered, he's like, hey, I found this. The WPAD file's not there. Do you think you accidentally deleted it? I'm like, yeah, that's probably what happened. He's like, well, what do you want me to say? I'm like, go tell him I broke it. You know, I, I think a lot of times we have this uh, uh, mentality that, oh, that we have to do everything perfect. And if we yeah. break something, then it makes us a lesser engineer or whatever. But to me, like, I have to be able to trust the people I work with, the people on my team. And so if they break something, it is actually much worse to break something and not known up to it yes. um, than the breaking it itself. Um, I've seen people cause themselves way more problems professionally because eventually, I mean, network engineers are curious by nature. They're going to figure out what happened. I, I so, thought we were naughty by nature. You know. uh, we're, we're detectives, yeah. <laughs> right? We're detectives. We're going to figure out what you did. And what right. Happened, right. Right. So. so that for me was like, you know, just say it. You know, I broke a third of the internet. It's all okay now. We put the file <laughs> back and people can, you know, Go on about their merry way. The network's always guilty anyway, so you might as well. All the time. It's always the network. I think there's another lesson in there as well that's, uh, that I think is, is interesting. It might be a show all into itself. And you said the load balancer didn't detect this outage, right? We test for all these conditions, but knowing which conditions to test for sometimes is the biggest challenge. Yep. And I don't even know. I mean, can you configure load balancers to test for the presence of that file? Who knows? But, you know, here was, you know, here's another piece of your network that could have you know, dynamically well, fix the issue if it had known. And to anticipate yeah. that, that that, because it's always after the fact, oh, well, we can test for this one particular thing. So that thing never <laughs> happens again. Yeah. Well, the likelihood yeah. of that particular thing ever happening again is pretty small, but there'll be another thing that you yeah. haven't thought of. So yeah. that's the challenge. And, and to you your point, get, oh, you didn't get in trouble, did you, Yvonne? No. Yeah. No. You just owned it right away? Yep. That, that's yeah, a good yeah. lesson. That's a good lesson learned, I, I have to say. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think that's one of the best lessons to learn. I think um, your reputation really dictates you in, yeah. the, in the industry, right? And if, if you try and hide that you did something, I mean, that, that shows who you are. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really important lesson. And the problem is too many people don't understand that there's a huge, huge definition between accepting blame and accepting responsibility. Mm. Accepting responsibility says, I'm going to fix it. Even if I did it, I'm going to fix it. Mm -hmm. Accepting blame, you're hanging your head between your you're hanging your head mm -hmm. between your your legs and just kind of walking away. Nobody respects that. So own up to it, yes, and own up to making it right. No. Exactly. And, and nobody does this for a living without breaking stuff. I mean, it's no. It's, oh. <laughs> I think that's kind of the whole purpose of the show, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we've got a lot of talent sitting around this virtual roundtable right now. People who've been in this industry for a little while. I see, I, I'm counting three plaques behind Mike there. There's, there's a few. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and a lot of books there, Jody. Uh, he, oh, he's getting his. Uh, <laughs> one back there, too. Not yeah. to be undone. My own <laughs> is the one behind me that says, bless your heart. He still but, beats me by, by two. I'm, uh, yeah, no, but you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of experience right here, and we've all made mistakes. And, yeah. you know, they didn't stop 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ruin my story. But I took down a major hospital system uh, here in my region with one line of configuration, and I did this about six months ago. So you know, mm -hmm. mistakes happen. You just have to own them yeah. and fix them. What can you do? I, I feel like I make mistakes in phases. Honestly, like um, I get maybe Coming complacent. Right. So I make I make 
um, mistakes and faces. You know? Well, I think that's it. So, um, yeah, I think it speaks a lot too, is, is that when we think that we, we have it all under control is usually when yeah. we don't. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, if you're, not, if, if you're not admitting it, you're just one bad day away from, you know, from your company not wanting you, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if, if your company is not going to, to stand by you when you make an honest mistake, then you're just, you're just any bad day is, is, is going to be that day. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that, Yvonne. How about you, Phil? I, I understand yours is, is a little bit different <laughs> yeah. of a story. Uh, that's good. Mine is too. So go ahead. Yeah, that's yeah no, I can talk about when I shut down an SVI and, and things went bad. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, a, an unfamiliar GUI that I clicked on a thing I shouldn't. And I, I dropped all remote access VPN connections, hundreds, you know, yeah. and then they all repopulated. And then when you get the help desk call, you're like, oh, no, everything looks good. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> there's, there's so many there's, times. There's a classic one here that, uh, yeah. that Matt uh, from uh, Twitter had put out there, and it's, we've all done it right, is the, uh, is the VLAN ad in a oh, trunk yeah. command. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and le leaving mm -hmm. out the ad command, and all of a sudden that trunk allows one VLAN. Yeah, we've all done but, that one. Yeah. But there's one, I mean, so I've done a lot of those that I had the lessons learned that are technical lessons learned that I stick in my brain, right? But there's one that, that got me in the heart. Okay. And uh, I, this was about eight years ago, nine years ago. And um, I worked for a, a smallish bar, a regional bar in my area. And uh, we, I was at a, a multi-site like law firm or medical practice, whatever it was. And they had like their server room was just like four racks of, of gear. And uh, the last rack was their network gear with their core switch. And then some uh, 2,900 routers on the top, ASAs and the whole thing. And uh, the, the last rack wasn't bolted down. The others were, and they were perfectly lined up. You're laughing because you know it. <laughs> and I have a slight OCD about things being neat and clean. Like I Again, love yeah. just, just you. None of the rest of us, none of us are detail-oriented and yeah. focused on the stupid stuff. Like I love, yeah. I love uh, Victorian garden and, and my bed made perfectly and my couch is lined up with the floorboards, which is where I'm going with this. So, you know, I, I'm looking down at the, uh, the, the base of the racks and they're parallel to the tiles and that makes me feel good inside and so, <laughs> so the last rack was not and it wasn't bolted down so i'm like i'm gonna make this parallel and fit and line up perfectly so again this wasn't like i took down all the bgp peers for some global network i just grabbed that rack like a bolt in a china shop that's what i'm trying to say and started yanking it trying to do it and all of a sudden when i gave it a good yank and it turned i heard pop 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 I stopped, turned around. Their core switch was like a 4,500 or something. This is uh, not all were 10 gig ports. This is when 10 gig was just starting to come out, you know, for your uplinks and stuff. A bunch of one gig ports, a couple of 10 gig ports, a, a bunch of ports, all just snapped those cables right out. Uh, <laughs> took down sections of the network, but I was able to get those patched in real quick, assign the <laughs> VLANs. People were like, oh, is everything okay? We lost connectivity. And I'm like, no. Oh, I don't know. Everything looks fine here. And they're like, yeah, I guess, I guess my phone is online. That was weird. I'm like, yeah, it was weird anyway. And then they live. But uh, that, that, that really taught me to just take it easy. You know, <laughs> like, that was maybe, maybe tone down the OCD just yeah, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Non-essential thing. And now my catchphrase that I use for myself is, Hey, 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 everything's okay. Nobody needs to wiggle any wires right now. Let's take it one step at a time and think about this very methodically. And I apply that lesson to like the rest of my life that has nothing to do with networking. Well, all my life has to do with networking, but. Um, That's a really long catchphrase, by the way. What's that? That's a really long catchphrase. No, 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 no. Everything's okay. Don't wiggle any wire. That's yeah, just, just the next time you see Phil, just ask him how, how long he took to set up his lighting, you know, for today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now to go back, I want to talk about, you know, Zig, Zig and, and Yvonne, you know, mentioned, oh yeah, you know, you got to own it. I immediately, like I started to sweat because I'm like, how, I'm thinking cost per port, you know? So these switches are like 20 grand a pop. What is that per port? And I'm like, yeah, this is, uh, this is more money than I make here. So <laughs> I, uh, I immediately went to the practice manager down the hall. Um, I don't know if I called my boss first. I think I went to the practice manager, our customer. And I said, I want to I let you know what I did. And she just looked at me and goes, well, thank you for letting me know. Um, do we have other spare ports? No, she doesn't know what a port is anyway. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, you're, you're okay. There's plenty of room. And she's like, all right, well, then let's, you know, we're good. We're good. And I'm like, back away slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I get back to the office, I did tell my boss and he's like, okay, well, this is why we have insurance. Thank you for telling me and for telling her. And, uh, you know, we'll 
and I think he backed away slowly. <laughs> so stay away from the disaster. Yeah. So I, I got and smile. Yep. yep. So I, got, I, I had a couple lessons learned out of there. Uh, one, neither of them that technical, but uh, they, they stuck with me pretty deep down. Nice. Yeah. All right. So my story is, is a bit, um, it's a bit more on the personal side than the technical side. And it's, there's some technical and process failures in there as well, just to make sure that I, you know, meet the, uh, meet the requirements of the show, <laughs> invite me back. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so this all is quite a few years ago. I'm, I am the manager of the network team at an organization I'm working at. It's a nationwide organization, 45 small offices across the country. They're like nine to five type shops. We got four major campuses that they all connect back to. And we've been working this project where we had been bringing an outsourced WAN in house and managing it ourselves. And you know, the WAN, the WAN in this environment was actually really not all that critical. Um, we needed it during the day. Uh, so those small offices could function, but like all the big sites, they were kind of self-sufficient. This was just IPsec over internet. And we're talking like almost a decade ago. So <laughs> voice was not a consideration. Those mm -hmm. types of things weren't there. Yeah. And the other, the other thing, other wonderful thing about this is we got these really great uh, windows to work in. So like after 7 p.m., before 7 a.m., no one cared if the WAN went down. And so, um, so there's a bit, of a, a bit of hubris, overconfidence, whatever you want to call it. What, we had brought the WAN in and it was actually already working, but I had overdesigned it. Uh, shocking for a fairly new network engineer. Um, and figured out that we didn't need 3,000 different alternative paths for each every site and all those types of things. And <laughs> so this, the story really starts at the point where I am, I am undoing that complexity, right? I wanted, I wanted other people to be able to help me on this WAN and it just wasn't going to happen the way I designed it. And so we, we're in this, this outage uh, or planning this outage window where we're going to reduce complexity and kind of make this thing a little bit easier. This all sounds great, right? And so I go in and I, I plan this. But when I say I plan this, I mean, I've got this. I've been doing this for a while now. I know what I'm doing. I've already built the WAN once. How much of a plan do I need? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So, um, so <laughs> and I've also got... That's like, the catch for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much of a plan do I need? Yeah. So I've got, I've got 12 hours to do this change. It's going to take me four or five. It's no big deal. So I start it. And, uh, and I'm going, now this was all Juniper equipment. I was using Juniper NSM. If any of you have used Juniper NSM, you're cringing right now. It's probably like all of three people in the world that's ever used the product, but <laughs> it was one of these like very early orchestration products. It pushed out configurations. But one of the problems with it is that if the database got out of sync with the configurations, you pretty much had just to wipe the database and start over again and push everything out. And sure enough, in the middle of this change, this happens, right? And I'm, but they, still, this is okay. I know this network inside and out. I built it by hand the first time. It's artisanal. It's my creation. Like, you know, like this is, this is I, can, I can build this without looking at it. I've got this. Yeah. Um, and here's where the complication comes in. So I'm, I'm going to bring another person into the story. And that's, that's my lovely wife, who I believe is watching right now. So hi, Joy. Um, what, what I didn't share is that, my, uh, is that my wife was nine months pregnant. And about, I don't know, two or three minutes after I completely wipe out this national WAN, she comes and tells me that, you know, she's in labor. Oh. <laughs> Wait, that's not the blunder, is it? The blunder is the no, 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 no the that, that's not the blunder. That's not the blunder at all. Okay. No, not at all. So, um, so all of a sudden, this situation has dramatically changed. What was like a nearly infinite window, right, has, has become a, a very finite window of which I don't know where the end is. Hmm. Also, my attention is now split because I'm not a jerk. Like my wife is starting labor and now I'm trying to be the attentive husband and also trying not to lose my job all at the same time. Uh, because I know that once we leave for the hospital, there's no working on this. Like we're going in. This wasn't our first. And so, and my wife goes through labor fairly quickly. So there wasn't like a, oh, I've got 24 hours. This is all good. <laughs> no, no, this was happening and this was going to happen rather rapidly. So that's, you know, that's when the stress set in, um, is, is right at that moment. And so, you know, I'm furiously typing, smoke's coming off the keyboard, sweat's dripping off my eyebrows, you know, you, you, yeah. you get the picture. And, uh, and I furiously rebuilt this WAN, and I think it was about an hour and a half it took me to rebuild it from the ground up. Now, the, the, the wise thing to do at that point, right, would have been say, hey, Jordan, don't be an idiot, hand this off to your coworker, right? Mm -hmm. It was the manager a group of people who managed the network. But so, no. <laughs> but hold on. 
I was so smart that I didn't bring anyone along with me when I did this. I didn't, uh -oh. I, I didn't, I didn't help anyone know how to manage Juniper equipment. That was new to our environment. No and, good can come of this. Exactly. And, and, and on top of that, the, uh, the, the WAN, we hadn't managed. Like everyone who worked there who was experienced always just called somebody, right? And that's no longer the case. We just brought it in house. So we didn't have a ton of WAN experience in house either. And I just ran and I just implemented this thing all on my own. And it was completely my fault, but I had nobody to call. There was nobody to call. And so that was lesson number one is if you're implementing something serious, you should never do it without someone else who knows how to do what you're doing. The, and I know that's gonna, it's gonna irritate some people. Those people who work by themselves, that's no fault of your own, right? Like you can't have a partner <laughs> to figure it out. Well, that's not your problem. I, I don't know what to tell you. Mm -hmm. But if you have somebody who can come along and learn this stuff, make sure that they do, don't implement anything until that's done. Um, so, uh, the other side of this is I kind of entered this change really lackadaisically, right? I, I was so confident in my skills and, you know, and, you know, it's going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back. Rightfully so. I was able to rebuild the WAN. I was successful in getting it done. But the problem was, is I didn't have a rollback plan. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a really good test plan either. Mm -hmm. And so while I got the, while I got the network back up in time for me to leave, uh, that didn't, I didn't thoroughly test because I didn't have a test plan. I was just going to kind of invent that as I, as I did it, I guess. Right. Um, and I certainly didn't have a rollback plan. I didn't anticipate the fact that NSM could crash and that I'd have to possibly restore the database because if I had anticipated that I could have been a half hour, restore the database, be done, mm -hmm. hunt, come back, do the change a different day and all is good. But no, yeah, I was, baby. I was yeah. past the point of no return. I was building it one way or another. Yeah. And so it was just, you know, massive. And so, uh, my coworkers that day got a very frantic email from me that I typed out very quickly that said, um, so here's what happened. Here's where I am and good luck. Hopefully it mm. works. So, so now today, um, this has made me a bit obsessive and that, uh, and that obsessive is I go in with, with three scripts at every significant change. Mm -hmm. um, and those scripts are, and the least important of the three is the change, the actual change itself. Um, but I will go in, I will not go into a change now without knowing every command I'm going to be typing on every yeah. device just yep. because there's no, there's no reason not to. Yeah. Um, the second and in the middle of importance is the, the, the testing plan. I think this is the one that gets forget the mo forgotten the most is I try to script that as much as I can. I want to know what I'm testing against to make sure and validate that it worked. Yeah. Uh, because if I had had that plan, I could have done better testing when it was done and been more confident as I was going in and not being available that what I handed off to my coworkers would work. And the last and the most important of all of them is the rollback plan have a way to bail out. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, so that's my story. It's less, less about the technical and more about the situational, but I think it fits the bill. But isn't that how it is? I mean, all of our stories here are about, you know, a human error of some sort. None of us talked about like, oh, I found this bug and then we stop. The story stops. No, well, I'm sure we, we, we've got those too, but yeah. 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 Well, of course, of course. Yeah. But all of the stories that we chose to talk about tonight, then therefore I, I have to assume a little bit more memorable and impactful in our lives were, were because of us. Or in Carl's case, because he's a perfect network engineer. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, no, but I do love that. I want to take a second just to, just to highlight this. All yeah. of us brought our mistakes except for Carl. Carl brought someone else's mistake. Yes. I'm just going to point that out. It's so, just because it's so I, 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 it, it was. And I've made the exact same error. I, I, I will admit, and more than, more than once. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but this was just such a good It's story. too big not to bring up. No, yeah. it's completely fair. I just, you know, I have to call but, it out. One of the things that I've noticed, like maybe early in your career, don't you think there's a bit of an adrenaline junkiness to it? Like oh, yeah. I, you sort of like the emergence of it and that I'm going to come through and I'm going to fix it in an emergency and I'm going to be awesome. Yes. And then eventually that just gets old. Like you That's don't want to be awesome anymore. <laughs> like you don't want your phone to ring in the middle of the night. Yeah, you want to yeah. be able to, you know, I, I put, I put a firewall in eight months pregnant, right? Like, I, I know what that's like to want to just have it work and step away. And that changes your whole perspective. And at some yeah. point you've got to get there or you're going to burn yourself out or lose your job. Yeah. There are a lot of downsides to being the hero. 
Yeah, yes. I, I think uh, that's for, for me, Jordan, Jordan nailed it. And I've, it's something I've had to learn in my career too. Um, don't make yourself a single point of failure, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very that's easy really to do. Great way to put that. Yeah, it, it's, I like to, <laughs> I like to sleep, as, you know, as that's, Jody works by himself. <laughs> and <yeah. laughs> The one man hired gun just out. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you got to teach your kids. You know, my kids were answering, you know, they were taking my own call, you know, <laughs> let, you know let a me couple of years ago. My eldest yeah. son went to work for one of my customers as doing reception work for them. And they had a computer problem and they asked him to help. And he very forthrightly looked at them and said, I am not my father. I firmly believe these things are powered by magic and that man has no business <laughs> how they work. And my customer looked at him, nodded, went, I see. I'll call your dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it interesting that so many of our stories we pick, I, you're right, Phil, they, they, they impacted us pretty deeply. And I like to reference them as scars because that's what they are. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think the, I think the unfortunate thing in our industry is that most of us learn that way. Yeah. And so I don't, you know, I definitely don't have any answers to this problem, right? But, but the problem... The problem is, is that if this is the way that network engineers are learning, is that we learn by the scars that we wear, that means that we're putting our employers at risk when this happens, right? Like every time, every time we learn one of these things by the hard way, which is kind of why I think this, this episode is a good one. I mean, I don't know how effective it will be, but hopefully somebody learns something and maybe changes the process, right? Mm -hmm. Because we should learn this before it's a problem. Like every one of these stories were things that we did where we just kind of like, wow, we really screwed that up and it's going to happen. Um, but I think, I think as a profession, we need, to, I, we need to look at it and see if we can't make that better. I, mm -hmm. uh, there are other professions that don't make these kind of mistakes regularly. Yeah. Now, I think our profession is pretty broad. I think that's part of the problem is that we're expected to know a whole heck of a lot of stuff. And, and by having that expectation, nobody can know it all. So we're all going to make mistakes along the way. Um, but it is a problem. And I just yeah. kind of wanted to throw it out there. Well, and I, don't, I don't know many people who came into this work like directly, like, I know one guy who, who had a dad who was a network engineer and wanted to be one, but most of us came in through some other route and there's not a lot of formal training, at least 20 years ago. I hate even saying that that loud. Um, when, when I was in college, there wasn't, I mean, it was computer science and you learn to write code or uh, like circuit design, right? There, there wasn't an infrastructure solid core training program that's getting better but I think that's part of the problem. No. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, I, think, uh, I think that that just about wraps it up for us today. I want to thank our panel. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, to come on and, and have this chat. I want to thank everyone who watched. I know we had a bit, some stream issues there for a little bit. Hopefully it got better towards the end. Um, so thank you for taking the time and participating with us. <clears throat> if you want to find us online, the best way you can find us is at our website. That's thenetworkcollective.com. You can find everything we're posting from there. Uh, obviously, we have a YouTube channel. We'd love to see you come subscribe uh, so you can get notified when our stuff comes out. We're on Twitter at NetCollectivePC. And we also have a Facebook group if that's the way you like to get information. Uh, upcoming episode, two weeks from now, April 25th, 7 p.m. Eastern, is going to be our second episode, hopefully with a more succinct and better stream. <laughs> and those things figured out. Hey, it's the first time. It's what happens. Um, so in that episode, we are going to be talking about uh, how to choose a routing protocol. And we're going to have a whole new panel of guests to come have that conversation with us. Uh, we are uh, pretty excited about it, and we hope you come join us. Uh, thanks again, and that's it for today.